Hey kids, Father Brad here, and for PSR this week, we're going to be talking about the liturgy and liturgical seasons, investments, and all the things you see at Mass. So we're not in the PSR building this time. No, we're going to the church. Yay! Come follow me. Okay, guys, we're walking up to the church. Mrs. Barras is here. Soon to be Mrs. Munn. She's going to lead us in. Okay, I'm taking you to what's called the sacristy first. So don't forget when you come into church, you gotta wash your hands. Oh, look how beautiful it is. We're going to the sacristy. Now usually you would go right there. You go through that door, but we're not gonna do that today because we're taking you to behind the scenes. This is like Cribs edition of PSR. Going to the sacristy. Sacristy is, it uh, comes from the word sacred, all right? It's where we get ready to say the mass. Okay, so this is our sacristy. Now I'm gonna show you a bunch of stuff today. Hey, okay, as I said before, we're in the sacristy. Okay, if you're an altar server, this is where you go to get vested. Um, and so first I wanna talk about this. We're talking about the liturgy today, or the Mass. Right? And as we've said before, it's sacramental, which means that we use our senses. Sacramental, it's, it's, uh, our senses are important. So eyes, ears, taste, touch, right? smell even. We're going to show you some incense. We're going to show you how that rocks. Um, sight, I already said eyes. What else? Touch. Touch. I said it. Five senses. Um, and all of those are used in the Mass. So now we're going to explain to you all the different ways that they're used. And um, so, number one, uh, vestments. I said you, if you're an altar server, you come to get vested in the sacristy. A uh, vestment is an old word for clothes. And uh, these are the clothes, the vestments of the Mass. First, we got an owl. Albus is Latin for white. Right, so a white robe, and uh, it, it, you know, by itself, it's kind of like moo moo, right? Like, come on, moo moo. So we need a cincture with it. The cincture is the rope that holds it down. <sighs> okay, so this is the cincture holds the the owl down. Now, in the Book of Revelation, it says that uh, there were people serving at the altar. And the martyrs were wearing robes of white. Now you received a white garment at your baptism. And at the end of your life, at your funeral, we'll place a white pall. Some of you ladies, when you get married, you're going to be wearing a white dress, right? So sacraments, uh, white robes are important, okay? It's in the Bible. It's in the book of Revelation. Priests wear it and altar servers wear it, actually, and so do deacons, obviously. So this is like the, the base level. Okay, it's to cover up your regular everyday clothes because you're entering into heaven. You want to be one of those people who is uh, at the altar in the book of Revelation. Then you put on what's called a stole. Okay, um, it's because we stole this from the store. I'm just joking, Dad we didn't joke. do that. Dad joke. Okay, stole. So obviously we have this on, but um, you put this on top, and uh, this represents the priest's power, uh, the priest's power to forgive sins and to consecrate the Eucharist. Now we, we would tie it down with the cincture because those powers of the priest are not in, the, they're not mine, they're Jesus's, right? So they're, they're kind of cinctured by the church. The church tells us when and where we can use those powers. I'm not just wheeling and dealing, okay? And then you have a chasuble. This is a chasuble. Now, it's a rose chasuble. I'll explain. Every time we put on one of these vestments, there's a prayer. So, um, the stole of immortality, the cincture of purity, right? Uh, the, the, the white garment that, that shows the, the purity of, of our uh, the innocence at the beginning. Um, this, this prayer for the chasuble is, is charity. So we have to, on top of all this, we put on charity, right? Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so um, this represents charity. 
And now there's different colors. This one is pink or rose. It's only used on one weekend during Advent and one weekend in Lent. Um, Laudate and Gaudar. Wait. No, never mind. Check that. It's only used one weekend in Advent and one weekend in Lent. And those weekends are called uh, Laudare week, uh, Sunday and Gaudete Sunday. Okay, rejoice and sing praise. Okay, and so it's kind of like a joyful thing in those penitential seasons. Woo! Then you have black and gold to the Super Bowl. And I'm just joking. This isn't Saints Vestments. Actually, it kind of is. Um, this is used for All Souls Day and for funeral masses. You can actually use black. Those are the only two uh, feasts or, or masses you can use that for. Then you have white vestments. This is for like uh, solemnities of Mary. Um, really, it's like a celebration. So, and you can use it any time, no matter what, right? It's a universal. Um, it's like A B positive, okay? Then you got red. Red represents the blood of the martyrs and also the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit. So if you think about it, um, you know, fire is kind of red. Um, it's fiery. And then, and then this is used for feast days of martyrs because they shed their blood for Jesus. And finally, the most commonly used probably because it's the biggest season is green. And I forgot violet. I forgot purple. Oh, I'll go run and get that in soon. But green is ordinary time. Now, ordinary time does not mean it's like blah. No, it means counting. So uh, like ordinary um, to count through time. So it's the, 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 you focus on the mission of Jesus and his everyday life. While Advent's thinking about getting ready for Christmas, um, Christmas is about the nativity. Um, you know, the Holy Week is about the passion of Christ. Easter, which you wear white in Easter, by the way. Um, Easter is about Jesus' resurrection. Well, ordinary times about his ministry, his preaching, his healing, his teaching. So that's what we wear there. Ooh. Hold on one second. Don't stop it. What does she do? Um, okay, and this finally, it is violet or purple. Um, this is used for Lent and Advent, okay? It's penitential. Penitential meaning like it's a little sorrowful, right? Where, where white and red are like fiery and, and stuff. Um, this is a little more penitential. So we use it for Advent when we're preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ and for Lent whenever we're purifying ourselves. So that's what this is. Let's talk specifically about the seasons. The church season starts with Advent. Um, it means coming, right? The coming of Christ. So every year it starts with Advent. The next season obviously is Christmas. After Christmas, we have a little bit of ordinary time, okay? Before we get to Lent. Then we have uh, six weeks of Lent, which leads up to Holy Week. Now, the Triduum, which is the three days in which we think about Jesus' passion, death, and the eventual almost to the resurrection, the Easter vigil, those, that's like the height of this liturgical year. Like that's the most important weekend. And it's really short. It's its own season, actually. After that, obviously, is Easter for 50 days. And on the 50th day is Pentecost, which means 50 days. Days and then we celebrate when the Holy Spirit comes down. Then we have ordinary time, and that's it. Did I miss anything? <laughs> okay, and then we start all back over again because it's a cyclical thing. We're celebrating our life um, now. So, we're going to tell you about the vessels. Vessels sounds kind of intense, but uh, this is what we use to, to say Mass, right? And they're not ordinary, right? You notice that it's not. The things we're using are, they look fancy, they look nice. Um, they're not glass or, or clay, something that could break easily because they will hold the body and blood of Jesus. Um, so we give Jesus the best. 
even heaven. If you ever seen uh, Indiana Jones, they have to pick the grail, right? What was Jesus's grail? And they pick the wooden one. Well, even that one in Indiana Jones was lined with gold on the inside because they knew you got to give Jesus the best. Okay, so first, this is called a, a chalice setup or a veiled chalice. Um, and you, the thing on top is a folded three ways piece of cloth called a corporal. Say it with me, corporal. Uh, corporal for the word body in Latin, um, corpus. You get corpse from that. Um, the priest first takes that off and unfolds it three ways, okay? One, two, three. Everything that happens in the consecration happens on the corporal, and it's there to protect the Eucharist. If any small pieces of particles of, of the Lord uh, fall down, they're going to go on the corporal, and then they'll be, it'll be purified later, okay? So that's what this is. And then we have what's called a pall, a pall, P-A-L-L. This is used eventually to cover the chalice so no bugs fly in. I know, kind of practical, huh? Um, just, just out of respect for the, the, the Blessed Sacrament and under the species of, of uh, in the chalice. Um, okay, so this pall goes over here. Then the priest will take what's called the paten. It's the small metal holder of the celebrant's host. And the celebrant's host, this isn't Jesus. We haven't done the consecration yet. This is just bread. Um, and But the celebrant's host is slightly bigger than the other host, as you can see it from the back of church. And it goes on the paten, right? So it doesn't have to be very big. Next, he pulls off the purificator. And this is used to wipe the chalice, you know, COVID regulations. Um, <laughs> uh, and and really just to, to make sure we respect the Eucharist, so we clean these in a very particular way. And then finally you have the chalice itself. Now this is called a node. You might have seen that because some priests, myself, I do this, um, once I've consecrated the Eucharist, I try not to touch anything else with these fingers. So how am I gonna pick up this chalice? Well, I, I use the other fingers and I use the node, right? So that these need to be purified before they touch anything else. Even if I'm like fixing my hair, I do it with like my pinky, you know? You know, you know. So you use that node and uh, there we go. And this is why a priest, I, I usually do this as well. You might see him place his fingers over the chalice and someone pours water on top of them. It's purifying the fingers that touched uh, the Eucharist. See, these are things that you might have noticed and not known why, uh, but that is why we do it. And then he puts it back in reverse order as he purifies the vessels. And then we have a veiled chalice once again. Now you know a little bit more about the Mass. Hold on. Let me get my library card. <laughs> Whew. Okay. So right now we're going to talk about the that was the chalice and the vessels and the vestments the things that you see you don't really see this this is the stuff that we read from either the lectors or the priest and the deacon right? and so we will take first the liturgy of the word right the, the mass is split up into two liturgy of the word liturgy, liturgy of the eucharist and so liturgy of the word uses what's called the lectionary okay the lectionary actually obviously lexio mean to read so this is for Sundays. Now, it has all the readings for Mass throughout the entire year for every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation and major feast. Okay? So right now we're set. The last time we used it was November 2nd for All Souls Day. Now, normally on Sundays, we're in a three-year cycle. Cycle, uh, cycle A, B, and C. Currently we're in A, right? So we're in year A, we're reading the Gospel of Matthew. And year B will be reading Mark. And year C will be reading Luke. And throughout the year, and, and maybe Easter, and Lent, and, and Christmas, special feast days, we read John. So if you go to Mass every Sunday for three years, 
you almost read the entire Bible. Some of it's not in there, but you read the first reading from the Old Testament. There's a responsorial psalm, so all 150 psalms you'll hear. Um, the second reading is from the letters of St. Paul or some of the other letters from the New Testament. And then the gospel reading is from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And it goes through three years. Woo, 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 woo. And you read the entire thing. You hear the, basically all of salvation history in the entire Bible in three years. That's the lectionary. That's how we use it. Next, you have the liturgy of the Eucharist. Okay, And what we use is something called a missile. Dropping bombs of grace on our heads since year A AD 33. Oh, no, not that missile. Not M-I-S-S-I-L-E. It's M-I-S-S-A-L. Because this is the Latin word for to be sent. Misa. Ite misa s is the last words in the Mass in Latin. That means go forth. We say thanks be to God. So uh, I think of mission. We have a mission. You have a mission. You're supposed to go forth and do something. Well, the same. That's why we call it a mass because we receive from the Lord and then we go forth and do something. Okay. Now all the prayers in the mass are found in this book. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just know that um, the one with all the fancy ribbons and different things. You have Eucharistic prayer one. This is a nice little picture. Look. Last Supper. Woo! You have Eucharistic Prayer 2. Let's see. Ooh, another cool picture. Nice. We have Eucharistic Prayer 3. Oh, no picture. Boo! We have Eucharistic Prayer 4. Boo! No, you shouldn't boo Eucharistic prayers. Okay, so if you notice at Mass on Sunday, the priest says different things sometimes it's because there's four different Eucharistic prayers that could be used. Number two is the shortest. One is the longest. Three is the one that mentions the saint. Four, barely anyone uses. Okay? That's all we're going to talk about that. The last two things we're going to talk about are gestures, the things we do in Mass, maybe that you do even, not just the priest. Um, and then gradual solemnity. I'll explain that later. First, gestures. Well, the most common one in prayer as Catholics is the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now we're signing ourselves with the cross of Jesus because we're claiming ourselves. In the book of Ezekiel, it says that the, the, the saved will have the mark on their forehead, right? The tau cross, it was sheep. And they had the towel, which is a T. Well, it looks like the cross. But Jesus hadn't even come yet. It's a prophecy. And in the book of Revelation, it said the saved had the mark on their forehead. Obviously, fulfillment of Ezekiel. And that mark is the sign of the cross. So we as Christians, even here on earth, we use the sign of the cross and we mark our foreheads. Um, another time, my, another symbol would be, a, a posture would be standing up. You stand up a couple times in the Mass most notably for the gospel. When the gospel is read, you're sitting for the Old Testament, Psalm, New Testament reading, and then when the gospel, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Uh, did you stand up? How dare you not stand up? Um, so you stand up for things that you respect. If someone important comes into the room, you're going to stand up. The bishop walks in. Uh, the king of, the queen of England walks in the room. You're probably going to stand up and greet her. Um, well, of course, we're going to stand up for the gospel. Right? Um, other prayer positions. Kneeling. You kneel out of penance. You can kneel out of respect as well and adoration. So to, to prostrate yourself would mean to lie down, but we couldn't all lie down because that would just be impractical in the Mass, so instead we kneel during the consecration when the priest holds the host and bends over slightly and says, this is my body, that's whenever the Eucharist becomes Jesus, and that's why we're kneeling at that part. Another prayer position is called the Orans position. 
the Oron's position is when the priest holds his hands out like this. There's many references in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament of extended hands in prayer. Now this is supplication. This is asking for something. Okay, we're saying you are in charge, you have everything, um, you're the bomb. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Um, Another one is whenever it says a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark, glory to you, O Lord. Wow, you do that. And you, have you ever thought why? We say glory to you, O Lord. Okay, we're giving glory to God, um, but we're also marking with the sign of the cross our foreheads. May, may our minds always think of God. Our lips, may we only preach the, the cross of Jesus Christ. And our hearts, may what we receive come into our hearts. And so these are the these are symbols that are supposed to mean something, and that's what they mean. Last thing, gradual solemnity. Okay? Solemnity means when something's super important. Now every mass is not the same in importance. Okay? So you have what's called a ferial day. That's just a regular day during ordinary time during the week. Okay? It's Really important is the Mass, but it's not the most important. So on those days, we don't sing the Gloria, we don't say the Creed, and there's only three readings, there's not four. Okay, there's an Old Testament, a Psalm, and a Gospel. Now, then you have memorials. Okay, memorials, one step up. It might be a saint's day, a memorial, but it's not a feast day. It's just maybe a lesser known saint or a saint that's not as important in a certain region. And you don't even have to all the time celebrate that saint's uh, memorial day. Then you have feast days. Feast days are like the apostles. There's feast days of Mary. Think of, think of like uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel or um, what's another feast day? Like Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and, and you have the feast day of St. Michael the Archangel and Raphael and Gabriel. Those are feast days. They're, they're one step up. And on those days, you might sing the Gloria, but you don't say the Creed. And then you have solemnities. Those are Sundays and days like the Immaculate Conception or All Saints Day as a solemnity. It's the highest level of importance, and on those days you sing the Gloria, you say the Creed, you do all, you bake out all the smells and bells, the whistles. And that's the hierarchy, and so gradual solemnity. You might sing more. And then, actually, I forgot to do something. I'm gonna show you this. Ooh, you're getting real. This, is every altar server's either their, their worst nightmare or they're super pumped whenever we bust out. It's called a thurible, okay? And it's what holds the coals in order to burn incense. So you light coals, you put incense on top, and then you swing it. Probably don't want to do the um, sound effects, but. Now why incense? Well, with most of the things we do in the mass, it incites our senses. It helps us worship God with our bodies. Right? Smell is important. And when you smell incense, when you walk into a church, you should be lifted up into higher things, into heaven. And it says in the book of Revelation, which is ultimately heavenly mass, it says there's an angel standing by the altar of God with a censer in his hand, a thurible in his hand. And the smoke of the incense rising is the prayers of the saints. So whenever the next time you see incense, don't be afraid of it. Don't be scared of it. Think of it like your prayers rising up to God and the prayers of all the saints. The cloud of witnesses around you. In fact, it could represent the cloud of witnesses itself. The Shekinah cloud that fell down upon Mary and upon the Israelites in the desert. Right? When we go to Mass and we have the incense, we have the readings, we have the books, we have the vestments, we have the vessels. Those are all aids, tools, helpers for us to enter into a heavenly reality where Jesus meets us, He lays down His life, on the altar for us to receive him.